are listening to the Slash and Cast Podcast Network. Enjoy the show. <laughs> All right, folks, Justin here with a quick word before we dive into this episode. This chat here features myself and actor David Ajala. You'll know him from The Dark Knight, Star Trek Discovery, and The Fast and the Furious, along with his many other projects. In this episode, we'll discuss the Royal Shakespeare Company, the art of acting, Heath Ledger, The Dark Knight, and hell, we might even talk about some old school wrestling. So without further ado, here you go. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> All right, David. So I guess just to get us started, man, like I said, nothing fancy. Take us back in time. You're a kid. Yeah, what man. would you say sort of helped spark your creativity? Were you doing a lot of reading? Were you building forts? What was going on? The scoop is, I think I just, um, I was born and raised on James Bond movies and Eddie Murphy. Mom and dad, Nigerians, flew from Nigeria to the UK in the 70s with next to nothing but just a dream and a vision. And I think they immersed us in as much British culture as possible. And it just so happened to be that part of that immersive experience was to embrace the James Bond franchise Mm -hmm. and the Eddie Murphy movies. So I think maybe unconsciously, I just had a liking to it. I had a liking to the action that came with wonderful characters like James Bond and then just the fun of Eddie Murphy. So (laughs) in between those two characters, actors, even was something that was very inspiring to myself. I think I just enjoyed entertaining people, but not professionally, just just doing it in the classroom. Right, class clown, would you say that's fair? I mean, loosely, loosely <laughs> class clown, because I ain't no clown. <laughs> oh, that's a good answer. <laughs> So who's your favorite James Bond? Sean Connery. Good answer. I was hoping you were going to say Sean Connery. (laughs) Yeah, man. Sean Connery, just just smooth, smooth, but then also just just practical, pragmatic, fearless. Yeah, Sean Connery is my favorite. You know, it's funny that you say that Eddie Murphy too, because I've got a chat coming up with Robert Townsend and he directed Eddie Murphy's Raw. So that's just a weird little thing coming. That's in a couple of days. Cool. Exciting, man. Oh yeah. I got a little Robert Townsend. Classic. Yeah. Yeah. Classic. Where would you say your interest? in the stage started because you've got a very decorated background in theater so i think i remember this so i went to drama school two years and um, i think that's where i was exposed to a lot of theater and just i call it the rudiments of an actor's preparation and an actor's training you know exposed to a lot of theater exposed to a lot of techniques and theories which help you to use your tool as an actor as effectively as possible i don't think drama school teaches you how to act it helps you to harness what you naturally have. And I believe everyone has a gift. So from there, that kind of built my foundation to dabble with doing more theatre. So at, straight out of drama school, I started to do plays. Royal Shakespeare Company, National Theatre, Almeida Theatre. And then I went back into doing a bit more TV and film. But naturally, I always returned back to the theatre because that just felt like the best place to always kind of... You know, I like him to... Who is it that said this? Vanessa Redgrave. I worked with Vanessa Redgrave a few years ago in New York on a TV series. And she said something which I thought was just so bang on she said it way better than i could have articulated it she said that doing theater for her is like having a passport and getting your visa stamps in your passport it just gives you access and every now and then you have to always get that passport stamped and i thought yeah that's bang on right so i like it i i I have the same sentiment when i think about theater i like that now did your parents push you that way were you naturally interested in it were they in the arts at all they were you know my mom and dad mom is a retired nurse dad is a semi-retired security guard i think when i told them i wanted to get into acting the main thing that they said to me was just in all that you do work hard and be the best that you can be and i think that school of thought was always encouraged in my household Mm. amongst all my siblings you know 
I have five siblings and I think them instilling that in me just really gave me the confidence to just really embrace and enjoy the journey without the unnecessary added pressure mm-hmm. in a very competitive industry as I've come to learn and understand. So that was that was really helpful that they were that supportive and simple. Out of your five siblings, did anybody else pursue acting or is it just you? I think it's just me that was a slightly wild one. <laughs> <laughs> I have these random thoughts where I think about if there was a, I don't know, a TV or film project and all my siblings had to appear in the project, who would enjoy the process of acting the most and who would enjoy it the least? And it always makes me chuckle. I think enjoying it the most would probably be my older brother, Gabriel, the least, <laughs> I don't know, probably my eldest brother, Bookie. Yeah, I think everyone else will kind of just crack on and get on with it. Now, why do, why do you think he would enjoy it the least? What aspects? I think it's, he wouldn't be able to take himself seriously. Uh, and he would keep giggling. <laughs> That's why I think it'll be the least enjoyable. Not because not enjoying it, but it's just, I think maybe it's because he can't. He wouldn't be able to get to the place of taking it serious enough for the audience to believe in the character. But I believe he can do it. But that's just off the top of the dome. That, that's my observations of that. <laughs> So just sticking with stage for a moment, what were some of your favorite roles to play? 2017, I'm in New York City. I'm working on a really cool TV series called Fall in Water. And then this call comes in and I'm about to round up shooting season one of the show. And then my agent in the UK says, David, there's this really fantastic play that has come in. It's called One Night in Miami. And it tells the story of the night Muhammad Ali beat Sonny Liston to become the world heavyweight champion. And when he changed his name officially and publicly to uh, Cassius X, Cassius Clay. And then he he said, oh, Jim Brown's going to be in, in this. Jim Brown is part of the story. Malcolm X is part of the story. Sam Cooke. And they're all in this hotel room speaking about life. And then I read the scripts and I thought, this is brilliant. And at the time, my US reps were saying, David, we've got some really cool TV and film projects, which made themselves available for you that want to just pique your interest. And I thought, if I don't put my hat in the ring for this play, I'm probably going to regret it. And I remember doing, going through the process of the audition and what have you, and then getting the offer and then doing this play. And it was one of the most profoundly cathartic special experiences I've ever had. You you have these four iconic black men in a room where there's no cameras around Justin. Mm -hmm. So they don't to kind of put on a performance and they're just speaking and I think what I found so special about the dialogue and the conversations were how open and frank they were with each other how passionate they were about bringing out the best in each other how their way of thinking didn't always align with each other and there was a lot of clashing because you know they they just didn't see things the same way but in and amongst all that there was a great deal of love and respect and I just remember performing the play doing our first performance and at the end we got a standing ovation really really humbling and I thought okay that, that was special but I'll compartmentalize that and let it be throughout the rest of the entire run we were performing this for two months we got a standing ovation every evening and then What's of the- course the one night in Miami and it went on to become a movie a screenplay which Regina King directed and it's just it was a blessing to be part of that lineage of storytelling gotcha I'm gonna have to check that out that sounds profound I've it's, never it's, heard of it it's special it's, it's really special the movie's available and I watched the movie and thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it very different experience a great film nonetheless is it a true story so it is true that those four mighty men met together in this hotel room after muhammad ali b sunny liston everything in the script is kind of imagined right and hypothesized but the things that they were talking about would have been accurate because they were going through those things so when it comes to acting specifically do you find that your approach changes at all if you're on the stage versus acting on the screen yeah I think when I'm about to do a play, one thing I do, especially if I have enough time, prep time, is I get back into swimming. Fine with swimming and when I'm doing laps, it really just helps my lung capacity. Being on stage, it's a joy because you get to use your full body. The actor's tool is their full body. And the stage really allows you to do that and it allows the audience to see that in every moment they're seeing your full body. TV and film, though the actor is using their full body, the audience don't always get the privilege of seeing the actor's full body from moment to moment. So, you know, naturally things are edited and manipulated and what have you. Acting is acting, but you always want to lean on the most effective skills within your arsenal to tell your character's story, be it theatre or screen. Right. And and I think the great actors do it very seamlessly. We've had several guests that performed with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Off the top of my head, uh, Simon Templeman, Sebastian Roche. They spoke mm. specifically how they were sort of shocked to be involved with that prestigious company that they grew up watching. Did you have that sense of awe initially? I did. But do you know, do you know what's so special about working with the Royal Shakespeare Company? Though 
it is, it's held in such high regard and that the, the prestige can't be spoken of enough. When you're there, it felt like round two of drama school for me because they're so invested in the actors and the company. They're so invested in making sure that we're able to perform to the best of our ability. So we do voice work, dialect work, movement, intense breathing. There's so many things that they do and they just really encourage us as part of our progress. So I guess that the specific nature within which they train and build the actors up kind of demystifies the prestige and it really allows you to just focus on being the best that you can be that's something i personally appreciated so how did that transition happen for you from your time on stage to screen how that first big break happen it's funny because you know with, with the big break i remember someone else asking me that the other day and i was thinking i'm not sure if i've ever had a big break i've just been grafted and getting on with it got to a stage in my life where i just embraced being the underdog Mm -hmm. but the underdog without having a chip on my shoulder i think it's really important to have a positive and healthy attitude towards your towards your work towards life as best you can and there's enough cynicism in life already and i'm not trying to add to that i'm I'm aware of it you know i'm I'm not naive but at the same time i'm trying to be as pragmatic as possible so with knowing that i was the underdog i just got on with it and just worked kept working and kept working and was just hoping that someone would give me a chance and then more and more started to happen in the UK and then America. Uh, the American market really just showed this brother some love. And I'm <laughs> very, very grateful for it, you know? <laughs> exactly. We're happy for it, too. So <laughs> Bless you, man. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like your first feature was The Dark Knight, which is a hell of a debut. Yeah. So what's that experience like for you now, looking back on what that film has become? Oh, it's mad. <laughs> no, legit. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. I'll, I'll take you back. 2000 and 2007 he had a call from my agent David the script has come in to audition for this role it's for a feature film the feature film is called Rory's First Kiss and they want to see you I'm like okay cool I'll go in for it so I've learned my lines gone in for it a couple days after done the audition got back home a couple days later agent calls David hey I'm that feature film we went in for yeah they offered it to you get in sweet it they said as I said it's a feature film we don't have too many details about this project but when we do we will forward them to you and be on the phone to let you know about the deal I'm like cool the day after, agent calls me again. She's like, David, we did a little bit of research and the title of the feature film you're working on isn't actually called Rory's First Kiss. You're going to be working on the new Batman movie. Hello, <laughs> David. Did you faint? <laughs> David, are you there? <laughs> I don't know what happened in that moment. When I blacked out. <laughs> I blacked out, damn it. <laughs> I ain't afraid to say it. It was wild. And then a couple of days later after that, this is how swift it was. We're talking literally a couple of days, a couple of days, a couple of days, a couple of days. A couple of days after that, I'm in, where were we? I think it was Pinewood Studios. We were rehearsing and I meet Heath Ledger, the late, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Heath Ledger. And I'll never forget, he walked towards me and introduced himself. Just the nicest, coolest, easygoing guy you could meet. Don't say that in a way of someone who wants to be liked. He was just genuinely a decent guy who was really, really focused on his work. Mm -hmm. And when we were in this special sequence, I remember him always asking the actors, was that okay? Is there anything we want to tweak or change? Very collaborative. Wasn't in character. He was in sweatpants and a t-shirt and a headband. Very easy going. And then whenever Christopher Nolan would give him a note, I remember he would go into the corner and he had this little diary and it would just make a few notes in the diary, put the book down, they get back into it. And I remember just visually just seeing him and thinking, he's still a student. He's still learning. He's still open to exploring. And I think that's so, so important. And I think he really set the bar standard for me in terms of the commitment to your work and the execution. So cut to being on set now a couple of weeks after. Heath is fully in costume and in character. And he had earned the respect from everyone to kind of allow him to be in his zone without kind of interrupting their space. And I just remember him doing take after take after take. And then after the takes, just being very quiet on set because it almost felt sacrilegious to make small talk because of what he was doing Mm -hmm. it was very very special and i think he became a bit aware of it and got a bit subconscious self-conscious even and then he would do these terrible terrible party tricks to entertain everyone (laughs) (laughs) oh they were so bad but it made us laugh so it worked and then he'd go from being the clown to just bam joker full joker mode so seamless so effortless and i will forever cherish that wonderful wonderful experience of working with Heath Ledger. you mentioned something that's interesting too because adding is sort of a cumulative job professional actor day one while you're a professional actor this guy over here he's been a professional actor for 30 years but yet he's still learning so right. i think that's a good lesson to take away with any profession really just keep working on your craft because 
you're never really done. Definitely. Is it fair to say that after The Dark Knight that that kind of opened things up a bit more for you after that in terms of work? So, no, I remember working on it because it was a small role. I remember Christopher Nolan saying, I said, thank you, Chris, for, for, for the experience. I really, really enjoyed it. And I hope to work with you again in the future. And he said, well done. And he said something along the lines of, I'm paraphrasing badly here because it was many, many years ago. He said something along the lines of, there's no such thing as a small role because you can always be impactful with a quote unquote small role. And funny enough, of all the things that I've worked on, The Dark Knight is the one thing I get recognized for the most around the world. I was randomly in Dubai in a mall a few years ago and this guy came up to me and said, David Ajala, The Dark Knight. <laughs> Like, it was just wild, 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 wild. And I think that film was just so, is very iconic and special. I think it just opened up the playing field for people being familiar with my face. But I guess what really kind of shifted things for me would, yeah, most prob probably be Falling Water, the USA Network TV series with the two seasons. That probably opened the doors a little more for me. For what reasons? I don't know. But I know that definitely things shifted a little. And I think people took more chances on me and use their imagination more to see me playing different roles like because the role in Fallen Water was a very different guy compared to our man on Supergirl Manchester Black to Cleveland Booker it's, I'm grateful for it and there's still a few things in my locker which will reveal themselves soon that I'm Alrighty. very excited to share you appeared in the so. episode Black Mirror oh yeah <laughs> for my money it's it's better it's a better modern day Twilight Zone than the modern day Twilight Zone but i think a lot of people would agree with you yeah yeah did you watch the show at all before you were on it i only heard about the show and the things i did hear about the show were exciting and it was definitely held in high regard so i didn't actually watch an episode until working on it which i'm thankful for <laughs> then it just meant i can really just go into it with really fresh eyes and i know each story is a standalone story in itself you know but mm -hmm. um there's something quite freeing for me personally sometimes not being too aware of the projects that i'm about to work on right and just experiencing it as an artist as opposed to a fan observing sometimes so that that was definitely the case with black mirror i really enjoyed working on that that was that was dope charlie brooker is him and his writing team are very very talented most of those really technology-based episodes will make your skin crawl because it's a bit too close to yeah. home now <laughs> right and you have to remember these were written years ago Mm -hmm. and televised years ago yeah my episode specifically was very loosely based around what was a premonition of someone like donald trump becoming the president the waldo moment and we filmed that episode i think it was like 2011 <laughs> yeah it's wild and if you watch it now in context it's crazy it will definitely make your skin crawl you know yeah. but there are some people just very forward thinking like charlie brooker who were just way ahead of their time just moving on to another blockbuster that you had your hand in fast and the furious six how was that in contrast Contrast to the Dark Knight set wise. I think that was bigger set wise because Fast and Furious, the, the, there's so many huge action set pieces and sequences that require so much meticulous rehearsals that it just feels like a bigger beast. It just feels like there's mm. a lot more people involved. Like the Dark Knight, we filmed Fast and Furious in London, which was really, really cool. Really cool to work on such a big movie in your hometown. I really enjoyed it. It was fun to be a part of that franchise and to just experience how, you know, the mechanics work in such a huge machine again it's important for me to be able to always just mix it up and mm -hmm. have fun when i'm working and i had some really cool experiences with michelle rodriguez and sung kang specifically and vin diesel as well really cool cool bunch of people did really you ever cool. run into the rock no and he, he was i'm a big wrestling fan so dwayne johnson mm -hmm. i'm a big dwayne johnson fan but it's unfortunate I just, my days never crossed over with his. Um, uh, would have loved, loved to have met him. I'm, I'm a big fan. Yeah. But I'm sure, I'm sure I'll bump into him soon. I'm sure you will too. Uh, I grew up a wrestling fan too. I haven't watched it a lot recently, but yeah, yeah Stone Cold The Rock, that's my era. Yeah, yeah man, Stone Cold, Steve Austin, <laughs> The Rock. I'll take you a bit further back, Bret the Hitman Hart. Oh yeah, Bret Hart. Smoke Warrior, The Rockers, Shawn Michaels, Martin oh. Genetic. Oh yeah, you're, re you're really a, a wrestling fan. Then. Okay, yeah, yeah, then. yeah, I'm old school, old school. I used to go to a bunch of WCW house shows. I live on the border of South Carolina and Georgia. Oh so, snap. Yeah, so I saw Goldberg debut, like not on television. He was just... Oh. 
there wrestling. So Sting Go came from bug. The, yeah. <laughs> Sting as well. Of yeah. course. Yeah. Oh man, legends. Legend. Yeah, Razor Ramon. My favorite wrestler is Razor Ramon. Scott Hall's my really? personal favorite wrestler. Yep. The bad, the <laughs> bad guy. Oh, if I had a toothpick right funny. now, I'd throw it. <laughs> well, let's see. You just started doing a bit of video game voice acting. Right I see Mass Effect and Need for Speed. Mm. Do you see yourself returning to that realm? Did you enjoy doing that? That was fun. I mean, I think it just kind of happened by, you know, as an actor, you're kind of just always working and there's the artistic side and there's also the financial side because you have to make a living. But you want to be able to, as I say, whistle while you work and enjoy the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with Mass Effect, that just came along briefly to do some voiceover work on it. Need for Speed was definitely a much bigger commitment because I had to do the motion capture stuff uh, as well as all the voice stuff, voice work on it. And then recently, we had the new Star Trek game, which is, I think it's out. Yeah, my character, Cleveland Booker, is in the Star Trek game as well. That reminds me, actually, I need to check it out because I haven't seen it. But I know, <laughs> I know he's in the game because, I've, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen what it looks like because I had to sign up the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope you're in there. <laughs> yeah, I better be. <laughs> the CW itself has a rich history of shows. I'm a big Supernatural fan, and they have, of course, they had Arrow and Flash and stuff like that. So what was your first impression when you stepped into that superhero world of the CW? Because it's pretty massive. It is. I tell you what, I love superheroes from Marvel to DC. I always wanted to be part of the DC, You well, well, working on Batman, but then you know, I wanted to be more involved in it to just flex my muscles a little bit more. And a few opportunities came my way, but they, they just... They were cool, but I was maybe I was holding out for the right one. And then when the character of Manchester Black came along on Supergirl, I thought, oh, this could be fun. This could be really, really cool. And I remember the producers speaking to me about the character and whatnot. It just sounded like an energy with Supergirl the show hasn't had yet. So I thought, perfect, that's going to be a bit of me. But I had no idea how expansive and how many fans there are of Supergirl and the DC specific to TV DC mm -hmm. CW world and you work in it and you see how huge the fan base is and it's, it's deeply humbling really humbling they always have new stuff going on on the CW in regards to superheroes yeah they don't stop they've definitely found their niche and they've, they've smashed it they even had it back in the day you know I think they had the rights to Smallville which was really started all this back in the late 90s oh, really? early 2000s yeah the first Superman show um, yeah 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 speaking of successful shows this leads us directly to Star Trek now I've seen previous interviews where you said that you had to educate educate yourself that you weren't too familiar did you go back to some of the classics how did you go about familiarizing yourself look star trek has been part of popular culture for many years nor for 50 years so something i was always kind of familiar with but never really watched the episodes or anything i guess when it came to working on the show i did bits of research and understanding of the world the franchise the nature of the show going back to the rudiments again storytelling how these stories are about people are about our minds and pushing the boundaries of understanding of intellect, being more, showing more empathy towards each other, challenging each other to grow. So when I had an understanding of all of that, I tried to personalize it to myself. Because we have to think about it, though it's in space and we're talking about aspirational things for the future, it always needs to be rooted in some sort of reality. So that was my kind of angle and into work on the show. And I've learned so much. I've learned so much working on the show with the people that I've been working with, with the fans that I've got to meet, to speak with, who have shared their stories who are so passionate, so passionate about Star Trek, so passionate about the stories that we tell. And when I think about sometimes when we're doing long days, sometimes, I kid you not, Justin, we're doing like filming 13, 14 hour days sometimes. And when we're really, really tired, speaking for myself and I'm really, really tired, every now and then I just remember a moment I've had or an interaction with a fan physically or online. And it kind of just sobers and inspires my thinking to just keep pushing forward absolute pleasure to play a small part in this wonderful 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 franchise oh yeah and i think you probably know already and you will come to know that there are no small roles in star trek <laughs> <laughs> everybody knows like every fan knows everybody that's played everyone in star trek <laughs> that's amazing isn't that so amazing yeah you just kind of mentioned it yourself you know star trek is one of those cultural stamps type of shows so does that ever cross your mind when well, now that you're a part of it yourself and you just kind of maybe freak yourself out <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like so you see with star trek discovery when i knew that i was gonna sign on board to work on the show i was given a gift and an invitation from alex kurtzman i 
and Michelle Paradise, who are our co-showrunners on Star Trek Discovery. And I say it was a gift because they really inspired me to embrace a vision that they had that I was really excited by. And prior to that, I hadn't seen any of the episodes of Star Trek Discovery. And purposefully, I didn't because I thought we're going a thousand years into the future. I didn't want to become too familiar with the way in which the show is shot, how the characters are, even though th- th- there's so much wonderful richness in season one, season two of Star Trek Discovery. I just didn't want to familiarize myself with it too much. Mm-hmm. So I kept myself as open and as supple as possible to really embrace the experience. So that for me kind of demystified the grand nature of joining this franchise. And it just, again, Justin, as I mentioned before, going back to the rudiments, it's about the craft, it's about the storytelling, it's about the work. And that really anchored me to just keep a healthy level of buoyancy. Every now and then when I do see a customized pin or <laughs> poster or some artwork which has been designed or like merchandise with my big face on it, <laughs> it <laughs> it's, it's fun, it's sweet, it's surreal, but it's it's a nice feeling. It really is. I've spoken with Jonathan Frakes and Brandon Braga mm. and yes. they pretty much had the same answer that you did. You just, you can't really think about it it or it'll it'll affect you yeah and and if you look here's what what happens if you do think about it if you do think about it be at peace and embrace that's a blessing and keep right. it moving exactly exactly don't you know what I mean? it. embrace it keep it moving to date what would you say has been your most challenging role which one has kept you up at night i think it was it was this current season season four of star trek discovery was probably the most challenging because we we shot it in a pandemic with a very very robust protocol systems in place covid protocol systems in place on set and off set our cast we're used to hanging out with each other and having games night and what have you and then now it's been stripped down so much that even on set we can't even embrace each other it was tough and i think on and off set a lot of people going through through different kind of personal things which were really really challenging and I was away from my family for months on end and then it was just having to deal with the grief that Cleveland Booker was going through it did feel heavy and I always just tried to embrace the buoyancy as much as possible but I think I don't know what happened but a very weird thing happened which I haven't experienced before where I literally felt a lot of the pain and tears of the people around me off camera and on camera and I think that, that that just weighed a bit heavier than I'm used to I can't explain where it came from or even articulating it feels a bit whimsical because even as I try to articulate it words fail me but the, in the simplest way I can explain it is I felt the pain of the people around me to the layman like someone who isn't an actor we hear the term method acting thrown around a lot is that yeah a technique or approach that you lend yourself to yeah i think i think that, that there is this kind of golden mist which surrounds the concept of method acting and we, we hear about method acting a lot when it comes to hollywood i believe method acting and there's various different iterations of it is any method that you choose to help you tell your character's story as authentically as possible my method sometimes i like to listen to music before i go on set my method sometimes is when i'm on set i like to have some sweets or candy in my pocket you know just to chew on and still enjoy my method sometimes on set i like a good laugh so i like good banter and cracking jokes with people (laughs) but that helps me to keep light and healthy so i can dive in to however deep this character needs to be or whatever but method acting is is whatever method helps you to get into doing what you need to do i only have one rule and it's to be respectful that's my only rule that should be part of everybody's rule book yeah because if you if if we're doing method acting and we're doing a scene and you slap me i'm gonna slap you back (laughs) (laughs) so no no listen i ain't i ain't that guy no don't don't (laughs) find me don't don't, don't tell me you were feeling it yeah because i was feeling it too and i slapped you back (laughs) exactly if a method actor slaps you just say well i'm a method actor too Shay, nice to meet you (laughs) we're from the same cloth (laughs) i guess to wind down here david what's the best advice that you've received as an actor you know sometimes you get bits of advice which at the time makes sense but it doesn't click until later on i think one of the best bits of advice I receive. Keep the passion alive and don't forget to breathe. Keep the passion alive. I'm in an industry where you, as an actor, especially an actor starting off, you're going to go into a room to audition and people are going to tell you, we liked what you did, but um, it just didn't work out. It was between you and another actor, but uh, we went a different way. Oh, we like you, but we need you to be a bit taller. Oh, we need you to be a bit shorter. Oh, we need you to be a bit fatter. Oh, we need you to be a bit skinnier. Oh, we need you to be this. Oh, sexier. You're not sexy now. You're too sexy. Da, 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 da. The list is endless. And in and amongst all of that, you have to keep the passion. 
passionate in life to be able to push through until the right people say, here's an invitation. We want you to be great. Passion is really, really important. Really important to see you through. Don't forget to breathe. I like in that, or I simplify that in layman term, or my interpretation is be present, be present. So many times we hold my breath. Did I get it? Did I get the gig? <laughs> oh, will they like me? <laughs> and, and all of that, it restricts you breathing. Don't forget to breathe before stepping on set. Breathe. When you feel nervous, breathe. When you're excited, breathe. When you feel upset, breathe. When you're angry, breathe. It is actually very, very practical. You it, know? Is <laughs> it is necessary. <laughs> Okay, David. Well, before I cut you loose here, what's on the horizon for you? Is there anything coming up in the pipeline you can share with us without getting in trouble? It's funny because there, there's, I'm aware of two things that I'm working on, but at the moment now, <laughs> we're literally figuring out the dates to sort some out. And as we're figuring out the dates, I'm in a bit of a limbo because physically I have to prepare for both of them, but I'm not sure which one would shoot first. So I'm like, <laughs> I need to know so I know what to do with my body. Two very exciting projects, which I'm really, really happy to be involved in. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to just these, these, the projects which I'm about to work on are all about harnessing one's craft, growing and being like, fuck it. Let's go for it. There we go. That's all you can ask for. Absolutely. David, it's been a pleasure talking to you, my friend. And uh, you too. Wanna, Thank you, Justin. I want to cut you loose and I'll send this down the pipeline and hopefully I'll see you down the road. Smashes. Keep out a great work, man. Thank you for having me. All right, and thank you all for listening in. Be blessed. You're more than enough. They else tell you otherwise. You're more than enough. Well said. David Ajala, everybody. That's right. Justin, peace out, man. Thank you, my guy. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.